ancient Rome don't really get the same documentation as their men, but man, when they do, it's purely presented through the eyes of a man, which is often prone to the idealization and sensationalism. Roman women would be praised for their beauty and chaste virtue, or cunning and dishonesty in equal measures, with little middle ground. In today's Bumblebee video, we explore that middle ground with the top 10 things you didn't know about ancient Roman women. Starting with how you're better off without them, apparently. Number 10 in the countdown. The Christian view of women in ancient Roman society came in and like the religion itself, quashed the pagan beliefs preceding them. Pagan times in Rome weren't a merry old good time for women, don't get me wrong, but they had more rights and respect when there was a whole pantheon of women gods whose tempers were to be revered and feared by every Roman man. But then they convert and answer to one god who was depicted as a soul man, making it, pun intended, a man's world. In the 4th century AD, the Andrew Tate of ancient Rome, Saint Jerome, set the standard on how you should perceive and treat women around you. If your wife has a bad temper, or if she's stupid, or if she has a birthmark, or if she's haughty, or if she has a foul breath, you'll only learn these things after marriage. You always have to tell her how beautiful she looks. If you so much as look at another woman, she feels rejected. You have to bow down before her and call her my lady, and you mustn't forget her birthday. It's worse if she's pretty than if she's ugly, because then you have to constantly be on your guard. Honestly, try and tell me you can't picture some old Roman bald dude in a toga, like white beard, one of those stupid teak tables, wearing the oversized podcast headphones, saying that exact tirade while like Joe Rogan is sitting across from nodding like, yeah, man, yeah, that's what's up. Hey, dude, kind of makes sense that you're only going to find out about her personality after you married her when y'all don't even know each other when you get married and you bought her at a bride auction like she's a cow for your farm. So, according to St. Jerome, it was better to be alone with God than in the company of a woman. Guess God is a woman because he was found in bed having an affair with a married one. Oopsies, hypocrite. Do you want to learn more about hypocrisy in the past? Because there's a ton of it. Subscribe to The Hive to see our regularly released history videos. Alrighty, that was a beautiful segue into number nine, the discussion of how women in ancient Rome could be worshipped but never equal. As stated, while Roman society may have been dominated by men, their original godly pantheon was anything but. They bowed to powerful women, begging for mercy or pleasure from their female goddesses. Part of the appeal of Christianity was bowing to a woman no longer. They finally became obsolete, powerless. But they were anything but powerless in the era of Roman paganism. Of the three supreme deities worshipped by ancient Romans, only one, Jupiter, the king of gods, was male. The other two were Juno, the chief goddess and protectress of the empire, and Minerva, Jupiter's daughter, the goddess of wisdom and war. The Vestal Virgins, aka priestesses of Vesta, were ranked among the city's most important residents, having been appointed to this role before puberty, remaining chaste for the next 30 years of their lives. These six virginal women held sacred duties like preserving the hearth, the hearth fire, and Vesta's temple. As it was believed if the fire died, so would Rome. That's a pretty serious job. They also had the most important duties in the kingdom, such as safeguarding the wills of the wealthiest and most prominent Romans, such as Julius Caesar himself, because women were more trustworthy than men, but they weren't to be trusted. Okay, anyway, the priestesses' religious significance gave them unusual power and influence, and they occasionally used it as when they intervened to save the young Caesar from the dictator Sulla. This worship of women and deifying them into earthly roles such as the Vestals had been the saving grace of women's rights in the horrifically male-centric Roman society. Unfortunately, as said, it was swept away in the name of man. Okay, a break from sad lady facts for number eight. Let's cover warrior women. Yeah, now that's more like it. So, from the northern most tip of the border with Asia, plenty of ancient European armies were happy to welcome women into their ranks. But historians always agree upon one exception where the army and navy were almost 99.9% .9 men. Can you guess who it is from the title of the video? Women may have been banned legally from joining the army, but your average Roman soldier would have seen their fair share of female combatants, as well as their own women on the home front. Professor Valentin J. Belfiglio shared that Roman women were capable of close combat as well. Not only were they frequent competitors in gladiatorial shows, but they, like the women of the clans fighting against the invading Romans, were known to take up arms in warfare, albeit in a non-official, unsanctioned capacity. History tells of a few of these women, such as Cloelia, who in 506 BCE freed herself and 20 others from the Etruscan camp and swam them home through enemy spears. For her courage, the Romans erected a bronze equestrian statue with the heroine seated upon it. Belficlio notes, on the highest point, 
along the sacred way. When the Carcinian general Hannibal was invading, women and men inhabitants fought valiantly and they burned his siege engines together. Hannibal would later face and lose to the honored Busa, who aided Roman fugitives from his war regime. So, in summary, women may have been banned legally from joining the army, but your average Roman soldier would have battled against and sometimes besides women despite that. The name game, it's number seven in the countdown. Women, like a lazy boy chair, an ice maker, or owning a cat were possessions in ancient Rome. And so, like the college roommate who complained if you moved their toaster two inches to the left, they put their name on it. Not in a label maker fashion, more so in a recycle fashion. From the moment of their birth, women were viewed under male authority. Therefore, the name of a baby girl would be close to her father's. For example, Claudius may have a daughter named Claudia. Augustus becomes Augusta. Constantine, Constantina. Okay, so maybe the rule was just whatever the last letter was, swap it to an A. Ironically, this is why a lot of women's names end with an uh sound. Talk about making historical waves, seeing as our society still inherently perceives names with that ending as sounding feminine. As the empire grew older, women in the ancient Rome were granted more freedom, often by sheer number of children they bore. Three children could allow a woman to become independent. Independence meant no more naming your kids after their dad, which isn't fair anyways because I'm sorry, but who carried this kid for 12 months and then had to push it out? Thus, daughters started being named after goddesses, their mothers, their aunts, and plants. Anyways, number six, once you were old enough for baby time, you were married off. And when that happened, you donned a stola. In my recent video, the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome, I explained the Roman marriage ceremony and also the garb worn. The flamium was an egg yolk yellow veil worn by brides that they would lift from their face and hair in preparations for vows to instead fall down on their shoulders and biceps. This placement of the veil signifies her donning the stola. The stola was a type of long overlay, sometimes it was in the form of a dress itself, but oftentimes it was an additional soft and light drape of material. It was worn by married and respectable women and was also associated with modesty. For those who could afford it, a stola with decorations around its neckline was available. This trim could be patterns, embroidery, beads, and motifs. When initially introduced, the stola was a preserve for the upper class patrician women in the early republic. But over time, the right and then the absolute expectation to wear it extended to the lower class women. The pala, a rectangular shawl, was also worn over it as a cloak and draped over the left shoulder. Any women who were convicted of adultery or were working girls or actresses were forbidden to wear a stola in public. Part of what dictated the stola, however, was number five, the stupid Opian Law. So in 215 BC, the Roman men who were overtaxed passed the Opinian Law, named after Gaius Opius, the tribune of the plebeians who instituted it. And it was passed one year after Rome's catastrophic defeat at the hands of the Carthinian general Hannibal. To summarize it in the laziest terms, opinion law was initiated by a group of poor people seeking revenge against the wrong source. Instead of trying to coup their government for the taxation, they lashed out at women and their already minimal freedoms. This new opinion law limited Roman women's allowance to half an ounce of gold and prohibited them from wearing dresses, multicolored garments, or anything with purple borders as purple dye was very expensive. It also prohibited women from riding in a carriage except on a long journey, pregnant or otherwise. 20 years after it's imposed, Marcus Fundanius and Lucius Valerius, the tribunes of the people, brought a motion to repeal the Opinion Law. Noblemen came forward hoping to persuade or dissuade them. A crowd of both supporters and opponents filled the Capitoline Hill. The matrons and maids of Rome, whom neither counsel, shame, husband, and father's orders could keep them at home, proceeded to blockade every street in the city and every entrance to the forum. As the men opposed and came down to the forum, the women tried to reason with them to let them too have back the luxuries they'd enjoyed before. The Republic was thriving and that everyone's private wealth has increased with every day. When the speeches for and against the law had been made, even more women poured into the public the next day when the vote was to be cast. Together, they besieged the door of the Brutuses who were vetoing the decision to repeal the law and they didn't stop until the tribunes changed their minds. The women of Rome as a collective forced the men to repeal their biased law. Number four is a bit of a strange one. It's what's best. 
Wealthy Roman women didn't believe in breastfeeding their own children. Instead, they handed them over to a wet nurse, usually a prisoner or a hired free woman who was contracted to provide the service. Soranus, the influential author of a second century work on gynecology, prescribed that a wet nurse's milk might be preferable in the days after birth, on the grounds that the mother could become too exhausted to feed. He did not approve of feeding on demand and recommended that solids such as bread soaked in grape juice should be introduced at six months. Soranus also pointed to the possible benefits of employing Greek wet nurses, who could pass on the gift of her mother's tongue to her charge. Did he think that she would be able to give language through breast milk? You know what? Never mind. This flew in the face of advice from most Roman physicians and philosophers who always suggested that mother's milk was the best for both the child and the mother's health and moral character on the grounds that wet nurses may pass on, not kidding, their crappy flaws or personality to the baby. These same men also usually pitched that women who did not feed their own child were lazy, vain, and unnatural, and only cared about possible damages to their figures. The hatred of women was very real. Alright, well, let's get away from the terrible medical beliefs of ancient men, number three will be the OG hair extensions. Historical evidence from Pompeii suggests hairdressing shops, known as torresos, existed. It makes sense. Roman women did have certain hairstyles expected of them based off class or marital status. E.g., unmarried women put their hair up in woolen bands when going out and added a gauzy hair veil to boot. While single women were expected to have their hair up, it doesn't mean it couldn't be styled. They pepper in braids, twists, and curls. More noble or prestigious women could arrange their hair more elaborately in various styles such as long curls and waves. The curls would be made by dipping tongs in fire. Cool, right? But one specifically weird little tidbit is that brunette ginger and raven hair Roman women had a fixation with blonde hair. This interest was caused when Roman warriors brought back captured women from France and Germany and quickly became incorporated into the imagery of their gods and goddesses, who oftentimes had dark hair or the more heavenly and revered color of ginger before this point. The Roman ladies would dye their hair blonde with pastes and powders in order to copy the blonde hair of their working girls and captives, but the color would eventually come off as they hadn't figured out the chemical composition to permanently bleach hair yet. To solve this vanity issue, the hair of the blonde working and captive girls was chopped off so Roman women could wear it as wigs. Might as well make number two all about the Roman face mask then. Why? Because it was gross. Just so gross. Y'all ready? Homegirls back in the day made face masks composed of sheep's wool soaked in a soupy paste mixture of animal placenta extra instrument and urine, as well as sulfur, abrasive oyster shells, and bile. Who's bile? God, okay. And this is before you'd whiten your skin. Another trend started by the arrival of the pale French and German captive girls. They did this with lead, dung, and whatever marl is. Want to reduce wrinkles? Get out of Canada or anywhere under the crown because the Roman women would kill swans, which is a crime under British rule, and use their fat. This was all part of Mundus Mulibris, which translated it means women's world, a reference to women's fineries in the ancient Roman world. This would include face and skin care, but also dresses, jewelry, hair care, all described in Latin literature by the famed Cicero, who noted it alongside Mundi Omatam, aka the ordered beauty of the world, and Kale Omatas, celestial adornment. See, there's some non-deprecating writing on Roman ladies. Good job making it over to the very low bar there, Cicero. Seneca, not so much. The depressing dude was quick to blasphemize makeup and say it led to the decline of Rome. And of course, for number one, we will visit Sappho on Lesbos Island. The Greek poet Sappho, who lived from six 30 to 570 BCE lived on the island of Lesbos, just off the west coast of what is now Turkey, and composed poems that live on in infamy to this day. As she speaks very openly about her homoerotic attraction and even implied intercourse amongst women. These poems are mostly written from the perspective of herself as a character. But what did the Greeks and Romans think of this? How could these poems be so widely adored that they're remembered to this date? So, like I've mentioned, men wrote Roman history, so they weren't particularly interested in what women got up to when men weren't around. As a result, we know little about same gender relations of women in Rome, but what we do know is telling. The Greeks and the Romans as a society, of course, recognize that some people are more interested in one gender over another, but the general consensus was not to assume this preference was a fixed aspect of a person's identity. Instead of thinking about gendered attraction in terms of genders a person was attracted to, the Greeks and Romans cared about the role 
a person took during the act of intercourse with an individual. For some Romans, a same gender relationship between women was the most confusing thing imaginable, as well as a little bit disturbing. They had trouble comprehending the possibilities of the relationship given that neither of those involved a man and could naturally take the male role. Layman's terms, these empires believed the act of intercourse was a free adult man proving his masculinity by dominating the territory of an inferior person. If there was no man involved, then there was no real intercourse happening. Therefore, women having relations, let alone extramarital affairs with one another, wasn't something men needed to worry about. Alrighty, my gods and goddesses and ethereal genderless beings, that's the end of another Bumblebee video, so I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe, and enjoy trying to find parking spots at the movie theaters this weekend. Thank you.